The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Starring Edward Arnold. Tonight's DuPont play, Experiment in Humanity, is a true story. And here's our star, Edward Arnold. The moment I read the letter, I knew I was through. Hooked. Me. Me. A.R. Glancy. Hooked, but good. I never had a chance. Sit down, I'll tell you about it. Ever hear of a town in our country called Duluth, Georgia? Population 628. Well, Dick and Nora Hull, my son-in-law and daughter, had a place down there, and it was on Dick's farm that it all began some years ago on a Sunday morning before Christmas. One of the milkers came to the house. Please, ma'am, could I talk to the bull? He'll be down in a minute, Henry. Have a chair. Thank you, ma'am. I was just saying I, I couldn't sit. Aren't you feeling well, Henry? Me? I'm fine. You look pale. Uh, could I bring you a glass of water? No, thank you, ma'am. Don't you disturb yourself, not on my account. There's something wrong. You're in trouble. Yes, ma'am. I'll call my husband right away. Oh, don't rush him, Miss Hall. Nothing we can do about it now. Sit down, Henry. Thank you, ma'am. You see, it, it's my boy, Olin, ma'am. On Wednesday, he commenced to look puny. I was aiming to take him to the doctor. Didn't get around to it, though. I just... Just didn't get around to it. During the night, ma'am, last night, my little boy Olin, he died. That's how it began, on a Sunday morning before Christmas. During church service, my son-in-law, Dick Hull, caught the eye of Miss Kate Parsons. She's the storekeeper's wife. He signaled to Miss Kate, and they slipped out of the church and walked down the quiet Sunday street. Olin shouldn't have died, Miss Kate. Only the Lord can say that, Mr. Hull. He was only six years old. What gets born gets to die. And the good Lord says when. He should have been taken to a doctor. Hmm. He should have been. The folks here don't have much cash for doctors. This has nothing to do with cash. Should have been a place his daddy could have brought him. What kind of a place? A hospital. Hmm. Miss Kate, there are 30,000 people in Gwinnett County, and there isn't a hospital for any of them. Well, I'm afraid there's nothing either one of us can do about it. Miss Kate? Yes? Ask everybody you know to come to the schoolhouse tomorrow night. Something on your mind, Mr. Hall? On my conscience. Tell them to be there, Miss Kate. As many people as you can tell. And so the next night, a hundred people met in the little Georgia schoolhouse. Dick didn't push or press or force anything. He just spoke about little Olin Burnett, why he died, how he probably wouldn't have died had there been a hospital or a clinic in Duluth. Well, that's all I have to say, folks. We need a place where a mother can come to have a baby. A place where a father can bring his sick child. We need a lot of things. A lot of things can wait. This ought to come first. Look around, Mr. Hall. No rich people in this room. Why you can't say you talking about takes a heap of money. Yeah, of <laughs> All right. All right. I'll give ten dollars a month for six months to see if we can make a go of it. What do you want for more? Only as much as you're able to give. No more than that. Well, I guess you can afford to give ten dollars. I can scrape it together. Each month. For six months. I guess so. All right. That's a total of twenty dollars a month. Now, who's next? Uh, ten dollars here. That's thirty. Please, speak up. Ten, five, one dollar, a quarter. A dime, whatever you can afford. I'll make it a dollar. Sure. Hold 
The total amount came to $80 in cash and promises of $450 a month. That's when my daughter Nora took it into her head to write me a letter. Now, I want to make something clear. Nobody in his right mind ever went around claiming A.R. Glancy as a soft touch. I began as a hard rock miner, and I made my way by myself. I worked hard, and I'm glad I did. And now, this letter from Nora. There was no doubt about it. She was putting the bite on her old man. Huh. Even though it was Christmas, someone had to remind her that my name was A.R. Glancy, not A.R. Santa Claus. So I wrote a letter. Darling. I'm just answering this letter from your daughter. Nora, your daughter, too. And she does write a beautiful letter, doesn't she? Beautiful, my eye. Let me see what you've written. No, no, no. I'm turning her down. Mr. Glancy, you're a fraud. Don't pull it away. No, why do... Dear Nora. Why don't you... Oh. Dear Nora, your mother and I were deeply touched by the story of what your little town is trying to do. Well, that doesn't mean a thing. Just words. We are sending $500 now to help get things started. And every year we'll send $250 more on the birthday of your little sister, Joan, who died of pneumonia 17 years ago because the drugs which might have saved her were not known then. We make this gift in memory of her. Thank you, my dear. mailed the letter. And well, sir, the good citizens of Duluth, Georgia, through Nora, had gotten to me. And that was only the beginning. Dear Mr. Glancy, the first baby has just been born in our little hospital. She's a darling. And her name, her name is Glancy Jones. Isn't that sweet? Based on a hook. There was nothing alongside the next letter which my wife read aloud. It's signed by Mr. Summerhour, the postmaster. Southern diplomacy. To put up job from beginning to end. Quiet. Oh. And so we citizens of Duluth, Georgia, find ourselves wondering if you'd mind if we called it the Joan Glancy Memorial Hospital. We found an inscription which everyone liked. To Joan, who in swift transition achieved eternal springtime, but through it, the lives of other children may be enriched. Isn't that fine? My dear, it's more than fine. It's wonderful. I was a little impatient to see that uh, hospital named in memory of my daughter, Joan. But a war was on. Because I had some experience in the uh, automotive industry, the government sent me to England to work in, on Britain's tank building program. When I returned, I was stuck into a Brigadier General's uniform and shipped to Detroit to take charge of our own tank and combat vehicle production. It was a long time before I could get down to Georgia. The hospital wasn't much to see, although my daughter pretended that it was. There it is, Father. There is what? The Joan Glancy Memorial Hospital. Where? Well, right there. Don't you see it? I see a tired old frame house. Well, it's got four rooms. Congratulations. How many beds does it have? Those lovely flower beds. The women of the town set those in. No, not flower beds. Hospital beds. How many, Nora? Oh, look at the good pay job it has. The men did that. Nora, how many beds does the hospital have? Two. Two wards? Two beds, Father. For 30,000 people? That's two hospital beds more than they ever had. Oh, I appreciate that. Your mother and I love it, darling, but uh, it isn't good enough. Why, Father? Because it doesn't look like a New York medical center? It's got a heart. It's our hospital. For rich, for poor, for black, for white. For those who can pay with money and those who can only pay with a basket of eggs and those who can pay nothing. No one's ever been turned away, Father. That's fine, Nora, but it still isn't good enough. The people here are doing the best they can. They can't do any more than that. Well, 
Those words were on my mind all the way back to Detroit. Now, there in Detroit, I made my own personal acquaintance with hospitals and sickness. General Zancy, can you take it? What have I got, Doctor? General Glancy, you've got cancer. I was lucky. It was an early diagnosis. They shot me full of radium, cut me open twice, and I got well. I got well thinking of a two-bed hospital, a hospital without radium, without x-rays, without fluoroscopes, without any of the scientific apparatus the rest of us take for granted. All it had was the kindness and the affection of neighbors for one another. That was a great deal, but not enough. So I went back to Duluth, Georgia, and called a meeting. Whenever you're ready, General Glancy. I'm ready now, sir. Yes, sir. Friends, neighbors, General Glancy has something to say to us. Uh, look. I, I've got a proposition for you. I want you to buy yourselves a tract of land, 15 or 20 acres, and then dig a deep well on it so that you've, you've got adequate supply of good water. Put the land in shape. Now, just those three things. Buy the land, improve it, and provide water, and I'll build you a hospital. I'll build you the finest small-town hospital in the country. Well, it didn't take long for the people of the roof to collect enough money to buy 24 acres. But digging the well and filling in the big ditches, bowing, howling, that was something else. The trouble was that they weren't up to the job. And I made it a point to tell them so. I guess I was a little rough. At least my, my daughter thought so. You're sure winning friends and influencing people around here. But I have to get things done. Oh, of course. And you are, too. They come in friendly and walk out fighting you. Uh, Nora, uh, Samuel Johnson once said that every man has the right to utter what he thinks is truth and every other man has the right to knock him down for it. But they're my neighbors. For the sake of your children, I think you ought to move. Doesn't it make you feel rotten to know that right at this moment people are saying General Johnson is Careful. a... It's an intolerant... Correct. I'm intolerant of people who haven't enough initiative to find a mule in a drag pan to level off a piece of lawn. And you can tell them from me that I'm going back to Detroit. You wouldn't dare. Wouldn't I, though? You just watch me. You are listening to The Cavalcade of America, starring Edward Arnold, sponsored by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. We continue our DuPont play, starring Edward Arnold as A.R. Glancy. My mind was made up, fixed, immovable. Only the... Well, I just couldn't go back to Detroit. They were fine, generous, decent people, and I talked to them like a, like a top sergeant in a great B movie. The more I thought about it, the more miserable I got. But Georgia people are not the only ones who can be proud. If they could sulk, I could sulk, too. So I waited, and no one came to see me. Not even one lady committee member. I kind of missed them. What are you fidgeting about? Who's fidgeting? You are. I well, I guess it's all that honeysuckle and magnolia fouling up the air. Somebody shut those crickets up. They make me nervous. A.R. Glancy, the only thing that makes you nervous is A.R. Glancy. I was in town today. No, I'm not interested. Did you talk to anybody? Yes, but you're not interested. Well, you could say that again. You didn't happen to run into Frank Madison or Minor Corley or Guy Findlay, did you? I did. What are you fidgeting about? Oh, they're my fidget. I'll fidget if I want to. Guy Findlay say anything? Why, he mentioned that... Did you hear anything? No, nothing. What did he say? 
nothing. I was sure I heard singing. He, he did say something. You just said so. What was it? Of course, that is singing. And it's coming this way. It was Mamie Howell. And some of the people from the Negro church, they knew that relations were strained and this was their way of trying to end the Cold War. They didn't say a word. They just sang. A half a dozen times I started to say something and I, I just couldn't. Come on up, come on up. Thank you, sir. General, sometimes when you feel something strongly, words get in the way. Maybe that's why we sang instead of talking. But now I've just got to talk. Go on, Mamie. Tell him for us. When a sick person comes to the Joan Glancy Hospital, they don't ask what color your skin is. They ask, what hurts you? Yes, Mamie. They do. General Glancy, I speak for the people of Duluth, Georgia. For white and color. You've done more for this community than anyone else. You didn't have to. You did because you wanted to. And so I'll say this. Maybe they put stars on your shoulders when you wore that fine general's uniform. But that's nothing. Because later on, sir, they're going to be stars in your crown. Miss Glancy? Yes? Will you... Will you ask your husband to say something to us? I think you'll have to wait a moment. The general is crying. to say a word. But the ditches were filled and the grounds were planted with grass and dogwood trees and I built the people of Duluth, Georgia, a hospital. An air-conditioned hospital of brick and glass and steel. It had an operating room and a dental office and a doctor's house and a nurse's home. It had every gadget in the world to make the birth of a child a little easier and a lot safer. There wasn't just one nurse now, no. There were 11 nurses on the payroll. Half the doctors in the county brought their patients in. It was wonderful. Yes, it was wonderful. But the operating deficit was $4,000 a month. And I just had to tell the boys I was running out of money. You mean, sir, that the hospital can't go on? Oh, nothing of the sort. If you haven't got any money... Oh, I got a plan. Now, what kind of a plan? Goodness knows what. Well, if you don't know, who should? The Goodness Knows What Corporation is the name of the plan. I, I beg your pardon? And what's more, it might work with. Oh, listen. I've been playing with an idea. Suppose we organize the factory to support the hospital. What kind of a factory? Goodness knows what. For instance, automobiles need seat colors. Good. We'll organize an automobile seat cover factory. Well, it's a lot easier to say than to do. Yeah, what do we do for skilled labor? Well, the goodness knows what corporation will train them. Well, how? Through a training school. Wait a minute, Mr. Glancy. What training school? Oh, well, the training school we'll organize. We'll find teachers. As soon as our people learn the ropes, they're on their own. How does that sound? Sounds good. I'm for it. You got my vote. No, I, 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 no, no, wait, wait, wait a moment. Not so, not so fast. That factory isn't going to pay 40 cents an hour wages. Yeah. No, sir. No, sir. It's going to pay as close to a dollar an hour as it can. Well, Mr. Grant, that's pretty high. Well, the American standard of living is high. Now, look. 
I don't want anyone going around saying that a so-and-so from the Detroit came down here and ruined us. Well, no one's going to go around saying anything like that. We'll go along. And what's more, what's more, I don't want to have to import foremen and supervisors from Atlanta. But that's the rub. We need local talent. And there isn't any. I don't know a soul in town who can run an industrial plant. You know, if you don't mind me saying so, you're talking through your hat. Oh, am I? And every time a young fellow has any ability, off he chases to the city. $210,000 hospital. It wasn't a roaring success from the start, not by a long shot. But before our first factory began to break even, another $100,000 went down the drain. But now the factories of the goodness knows what corporation are making money. Money that maintains and enlarges the services of the Joan Glancy Memorial Hospital. These days, uh, Mac Goodhead and I get propositions from all kinds of manufacturers. General, I like what you're doing. It appeals to me. Oh, does it, sir? It does. Now, I've got a factory in New York. It could stand a branch factory right here in Duluth. Now, uh, look, we don't want any favors. No favor, General. This is business. I've been through your factories. I like the way they run. Let me think it over. He thought it over, and he came to Duluth, Georgia. So did other businesses, some large, some small. It was good for the town. If you saw Duluth today, you'd hardly recognize it. The time was when a farmer counted himself lucky to have $100 in cash at the end of a year. Now his daughter works in the factory and makes $150 a month. Once Duluth stores sold only side meat and snuff and fertilizer. Now they sell home freezers and television sets. The churches have been painted. We have our first dry cleaning plant, first beauty parlor, and our first movie house. Yes, Duluth has changed. These days, I, <laughs> I leave the management of the factories to Mac Fitter, the tech sergeant who turned out to be a, a first-rate executive. Huh? Uh, I managed to spend my time at the hospital. Excuse me, General. Uh, would you mind getting out of my way? <laughs> What's his name? Her name. Oh, excuse me, her name. What's her name? Her name is Henrietta. Henrietta? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, General. Excuse me. Uh, well, what's the rush, nurse? Uh, we're expecting two more babies before midnight. Well, I, 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 don't, I just don't get it. Nurse, it's a mighty poorly run business. What's a poorly run business, Mr. Glancy? Baby production, Mrs. Glancy. One day, six babies come bawling off the assembly line. Other days, only one. It's a case of rank mismanagement all the way down the line. Considering that the Joan Blancy Memorial Hospital is about to bring its 2,000th baby into the world, I call it pretty good mismanagement. Now, why don't you go home, dear? Let the doctors and nurses run the hospital. Oh. <laughs> Every year now, on Joan's birthday, we have a party for all the babies born in Joan's hospital. Infants and toddlers sit on my lap, white and colored. Fat ones, thin ones, <laughs> laughing babies, crying babies, healthy babies. <laughs> you know, I've never had so much fun in my life. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you something. You know, there are a lot of old crocs like me sitting around wondering what they can do that would be of service to their fellow man. They wouldn't mind putting a good-sized chunk of money into something like this hospital. But they know that with taxes what they are, they couldn't stand the yearly upkeep. Well, building a little hospital where one is needed and building a little factory to keep it running is the best answer I know. It helps a lot of people. But it helps you, too. It's an experiment in humanity that makes you feel you can keep on living for a hundred years. Our thanks to you, Edward Arnold, and our cavalcade players for tonight's true story, Experiment in Humanity. Next week, Cavalcade presents the lovely young Hollywood star, Peggy Ann Garner. Be sure to listen.
Tonight's DuPont play was written by Morton Wishingrad and was based on an article which appeared in the Saturday Evening Post written by Harold Martin. Music for the DuPont Cavalcade was composed by Arden Cornwell and conducted by Donald Voorhees. The program was directed by John Zoller. The DuPont Cavalcade of America comes to you from the stage of the Belasco Theater in New York and is sponsored by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. Makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Don't forget Starlight Concert tonight on NBC.